in a world of economic uh, war, hey, because that is, that is basically what is happening uh, outside of the, the physical uh, military war, um, it is now possible to, um, let's say, to limit the possibilities of a central bank to step in. And for example, like in Russia, uh, your currency depreciates uh, quickly. Uh, and that is normally what happens then. The, the central bank steps in, either by raising rates, for example, or, 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 or doing something with reserves, uh, uh, um, also having some limitation on uh, foreign uh, uh, companies exchanging rubles and, and things like that. Huh? But now you see that what a lot of, um, I think, central bankers, economists and investors thought that these dollars were relatively safe. But now it seems that they are less safe than expected. And, and that has a couple of consequences. Of course... Um, uh, let me put it this way, that, that, that countries that are not on a friendly foot with uh, um, the US, they, they already had, but I think it's, it's much bigger now, had an incentive to de-dollarize, as you, as you call it. Welcome to the Gold Republic podcast. My name is Bart Brands. And I'm Alexei Jordanov. In our weekly podcast, we invite guests from all over the world to get valuable insights into the emergence of a new monetary system through the lens of precious metals, cryptocurrencies, and other financial instruments. Welcome to the Gold Republic podcast. Uh, as you might have seen, we had a little break of a few weeks. We've been in Cape Town for the future of finance. And as a guest to kick off again this little break is Jeroen Blockland. Jeroen, you've been uh, busy for decades in the financial industry. You've been head of uh, multi-asset at Robeco here in the Netherlands. Mm -hmm. And you've started uh, your own company, which is True Insights, where mm -hmm. you're the founder and head of research. First question is, uh, things are getting a little wacky and crazy uh, since uh, the start of the pandemic. <laughs> um, a lot of things happened. And um, the first question we always like to ask is, how would you paint that landscape? How, what, what do you think about the current uh, geopolitical tensions that are arising? How does that affect the, the global financial markets? Uh, there's war breaking out in, in Europe. And more importantly, there is kind of an economic uh, war uh, in a way as well. Uh, through sanctions and all these other things. We have rampant inflation. So yeah. there's many things that we will address. And uh, one of the things that uh, we believe you do best is actually have a really good overview, measure these things and create models around those things, and especially asset allocation. Mm -hmm. uh, so what is your two cents about uh, what's currently happening right now? Uh, do you want still talk about the pandemic or do you want to talk about this war? <clears throat> Because I think a lot of people have forgotten about the pandemic, uh, fortunately. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think uh, most of what is happening on markets now is, is, uh, is of course, uh, related to what happened uh, in the Ukraine. And uh, my two cents on that is um, <clears throat> that uh, uh, Putin has overestimated the power of his own uh, army. And I, my guess is that he was aiming for a swift takeover uh, of Ukraine and then, like Belarus or Crimea, uh, added to, let's say, uh, uh, the, the bigger Russia. And the result of the swift ban. <laughs> uh, with, Sorry, yeah, 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 yeah. And, uh, um, yeah and, and also that one of the ideas behind that, of course, is that he wants to have a big buffer against uh, NATO. Uh, so, so, so I think that is the uh, the um, reason behind it. And now that it is much more difficult, both from a uh, let's say uh, military perspective as well as an economic perspective. Yeah, you see, this will become a longer drag on on both um, people in Ukraine and also on on economies uh, worldwide and especially in Europe. <coughs> And, and of course, because of the sanctions, Russia as well. So now I think um, that markets will hope there will be some kind of stabilization, not even de-escalation, but stabilization. Because markets have a tendency to look the other way because these, these kind of events, geopolitical events, you, it's very hard to incorporate them in your framework, right? So whenever they have the chance, they, they look the other way. And so whenever there's some kind of stabilization, and we have seen that, Um, <clears throat> yesterday, when there was news that um, both parties, at least by their spokesman, were perhaps 
uh, yeah, having some leeway in, in the discussions. Now, the, the DAX index uh, rose 8% almost. <coughs> And that is, that is what um, um, markets want. But given the amount of volatility, <coughs> what I would say is sit tight if you don't have to trade. Please don't do because because of this 8% in the DAX, suppose that you have sold all your German equities uh, the day before. And uh, so so my idea is that this could take longer. That means that risk premia have to go up. And the best thing is to do, to only move when the odds of going either the bad way or the good way, and then adjust a little bit. And, and, and then you mentioned asset allocation. How do you do that is by determining which asset classes are most affected by changing odds in better or worse and um, um, asset classes that are uh, less exposed. And, and that is basically what you can do, um, but not much more, much more with volatility at uh, 30 uh, in equity mm. markets. There's also, um, Bart, you want to say something? Or? Well, you well, first of all, let me thank you for inviting us to this beautiful uh, place in Rotterdam. Yes, first time um, Arts of a Studio as well. <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. An old bank. Yes, <laughs> and uh, with a vault, actually, in the room. Paper vault, <laughs> I just said. Uh, exactly. Um, well, just to expand on that, what we've seen now, of course, is, and, and uh, I would like to hear your analysis, is we see that, that, China and Russia are really forming that Eurasian block. We see the EU as, as its own block, and we see the, the US dollar. We, we can see that, that Russia has been de-dollarizing for the last, well, decade. Well, what is that something that we should have, is this something that we should have seen coming? And what will this mean um, for, well, maybe the monetary world order Mm -hmm. in in the the future um about your first question that should we see this well you can see it because uh, there are statistics on how global uh, fx reserves are are uh, distributed hey, so we can also see and these are also reported that the russian government has been uh, uh, changing uh, the the composition of its uh, its reserves it has less dollars now in fact it has very few dollars uh, uh, now And um, the thing is, the, the new aspect here is that um, in a world of economic uh, war, yeah, because that is, that is basically what is happening uh, outside of the, the physical uh, military war, um, it is now possible to, um, let's say, to limit the possibilities of a central bank to step in. And for example, like in Russia, uh, your currency depreciates uh, quickly and that is normally what happens then the, the central bank steps in either by raising rates for example or or, or, or doing something with reserves uh, uh, um, also having some limitation on uh, foreign uh, uh, companies exchanging rubles and, and things like that huh? but now you see that what a lot of um, I think central bankers economists and investors thought that these dollars were relatively safe but now it seems that they are less safe Than expected, and and that has a couple of consequences. Of course, um, uh, let me put it this way: that 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 countries that are not on a friendly foot with uh, um, the U.S. they they already had, but I think it's it's much bigger now. Had an incentive to de-dollarize, as you as you call it. So you you have to find new assets or or, or new uh, FX reserves. Uh, and I can also tell you which which country will be the biggest uh, um, beneficiary of this. That will be China. Um, but also, if you so the 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 weight of the dollar in the global FX reserves is 60% still. Now, what you have seen, you can also say for other central banks that are are on a less unfriendly uh, relationship with the United States, it also makes sense to do some uh, diversification. Now, that is that is what I like. Eh? Diversification is my job. But uh, you can also... It's a prudent step for some of these countries to say, okay, I see a change. That change could lead that the dollar is less dominant. I would not say that it will uh, become... An, 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 let's say that it loses its status as the, as the, as the world re, uh, currency reason. But it, it can become weaker or it can be one of few 
um, FX uh, uh, in that uh, global uh, reserve uh, system. Now, and I think then it's a prudent step for every central banker, outside, it doesn't matter where you are, uh, to look at that option. Uh, so, so I think um, there will be a change. And I also think there is only one country uh, that has pockets and markets and, and, and uh, deep enough to, to um, um, uh, facilitate that, and that is China. Uh, so uh, you also see that the, the, the growth in Asia and also trade, uh, it's, it's much faster than in the rest of the world. Now, a lot of these, these, these countries are trading with uh, China and also for the US and Eurozone, the biggest trading partner is, is China. So it is also very economically understandable that, that the Chinese... Uh, Ramimbi becomes a bigger part of your uh, global FX uh, reserves. And also uh, we put out a uh, piece on that yesterday explaining that 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 this war is, is, is um, accelerating this trend. It is not that it's a new trend, but it's accelerating that trend. And that also means that um, unless you have a very negative view on China uh, when it comes to financial markets and investments, I think that, that the Chinese currency could become stronger. You also see that interest rates are higher there. So, so I would not be, want to be underexposed to Chinese um, uh, assets uh, that much unless, again, you have a very unfavorable... Um, uh, and, and that can also... Uh, and that is also another thing that... Is this a blueprint what Russia is doing for China and, and Taiwan? I think that is not necessarily the same. But yes, I do think that this whole thinking, how should I allocate my reserves, uh, is something that, that, that will be with us for years and, and will bring changes. Mm. Um, I think it's um, also fascinating to see what you just mentioned about accelerating. So there was this, um, it's not even maybe a black swan event, but it's an external maybe event about it's like a, a country invading another one, accelerating these things. COVID also accelerated many, many things, revealed things that weren't working really. And uh, um, yeah, we're kind of exposing uh, existing problems before. So uh, if China is the dominating, um, let's say, driver uh, uh, in terms of dominance, like now competing against the United States, what can we expect now how in the next 10, 20, 30, 40 years uh, will uh, the US fully uh, lose uh, its reserve currency status? Uh, will we have more and more, uh, let's say, uh, economic maybe trading zones, so which we we're all, we already seeing that China is building through Africa and um, most of the Eurasian uh, um, um, part of the continent with the, black, uh, the road? Belt and road. Belt Road Initiative. Um, what's your take on that? Yeah, so for 40 years is, is, is a pretty long time in the financial markets, right? Eh? So so I don't know really know about that. I do know that um, if you look at the depth of US markets, uh, that is unchallenged. So, so I think it would also require that markets... Um, financial systems in China in this case um, um, becomes bigger than that of the US. Now, you, they only have just started to open up and since they have all these rules, whenever it, it goes the wrong way, the Chinese government takes a little bit of that reopening back, right? So that is, that is completely different from the US model. So I don't think that the, that the US dollar will lose its reserve st status anytime soon. But I do believe, uh, and that's the second thing that you said, that there will be a system where there's a more evenly balanced um, 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 idea on how you how you um, um, hold your reserves, but also on on the relative power of markets and and things like that. So so I think that uh, China, the eurozone, and the US, uh, at some point, they will be the the, the three big drivers and then somewhere behind you have the UK, uh, Japan and, and maybe Switzerland uh, but these three I think they will be uh, dominating for the next decades and the weight of each of these blocks yeah, that, 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 is, that is my guess is that China will catch up but not overtake anytime soon So more balance uh, multipolar um, global reflecting, financial system reflecting uh, economic um, power and also economic size better mm -hmm. eh? so now as you see that in these reserves it's it's 60 percent but also if you at um, if you look at uh, how much uh, of the total payment system uh, china represents that's 3.2 percent 
Now, my guess is if you look what is happening in Asia and how fast things are going, that th there's only one way that can only uh, be up. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. This is also a thing where I think that the Chinese currency is the one, if you have to guess, that that is the one that will get stronger because of this yeah, in intrinsic demand uh, for it. But what, isn't there also a political risk from it? Because the U.S. system is not the same as the Chinese system. So in terms of uh, currency devaluation, which the Chinese are, have been doing uh, multiple times over the last decades, um, they have a tighter grip over the system than, let's say, the U.S. does, isn't it? I mean, it's actually more a question, a supposition. Yeah, th this is a Western opinion, right? Mm -hmm. So what... what What have the euro? What have the ECB has the ECB done? And and to a certain extent, ook uh, also the um, the 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 Federal Reserve when they did all this QE, we, the the race to the bottom was always mentioned in light of uh, currencies, right? W which effort does most? Uh, Draghi would actually said, whatever it takes. So I I think they do it by some kind of market mechanism, or at least they think so, but it's still the central bank initializing a depreciation of its currency, whereas uh, China does it by uh, a government. They just say, tomorrow our currency against this basket is, is so much uh, uh, worth so much less. But the, the, the power or the, the tool of a currency to balancing your economic uh, development, because most of the time that is that is what they try to do this is also why in some cases italy should have had its own currency because of its big debt i don't think it's that different the way that it, it expressed and that we perceive it is different but but um, i'm pretty convinced that especially the eurozone also uses its currency uh, as a tool uh, whenever it comes in handy and and there needs some to be some rebalancing in the in the world china does the same mm. they're not necessarily better or worse i would say Yeah, the system is different, but the angle is the same. Yeah, fascinating. But that all will have to be um, coexisting, more or less. And it's fa it's fascinating to see how the balance between the political system affects also the financialization of those markets in itself. And uh, th th this is the interesting question, right? Because we we live in a age after thirty, thirty or forty years deglobalization, uh, a globalization, and now mm. because what happened? So first. There are now more geopolitical tensions. If you look at the discussion between the US and China, most of the time it's about uh, intellectual property. And so it's about power, it's about technology that won't go away. So there will be a, a, a natural trend, depending who's in the White House and who is uh, 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 at the government uh, in, in China, but especially in the White House. It depends if you have Trump or Biden. Um, but you see there will be some... yeah countries or, or governments will be inclined to, to have a, a bit more protection. The second is that what COVID has learned is that these supply chains are, are, are much more vulnerable than we believed. So what will countries try to do? They will try to incorporate the most important supply chains into their own economy, even though that is not globally efficient. So that is, um, I do think that this, Let's call it deglobalization, but you can give it a name. A localization. Yeah, yeah. So, so that um, and that is a trend that is um, that is uh, I think uh, has started. I don't know how powerful it will be uh, because if you look in, within the eurozone, uh, there, there we, we get this uh, fiscal uh, union and and but but yeah, these given these these three blocks, I I do think this is a team, and that also raises the question because a lot of econo eco economists at least they think that. Part of the ever lower inflation that we have seen is because of this uh, globalization. So if you if you turn that around and you go the other way, do we have a period of, of structural higher inflation? And that is, of course, an interesting uh, question. Obviously, all of these trends are very slow. Uh, but but uh, yeah, I do think that um, um, uh, geopolitical tensions, but accelerated again by COVID has 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 laid bare some of these vulnerabilities and, and, and a lot of governments don't don't want them. So they will try to protect itself and most of the time that, that means internalizing it. Mm -hmm. Would that would that be a a good explanation for what we've seen in well also in these three blocks, but all over the world, actually, when it comes to higher or record high inflation. 
because well we just um, looked at the ECB numbers uh, today the American numbers were released 7.9 percent inflation yep. rate official yep. so unofficial uh, could be much higher yep. uh, European inflation 5.1 percent is the is is what the ECB projects uh, well of course in in China these numbers are always very vague but could this be a good explanation for this these high inflation numbers this this decentralization or deglobalization now as i mentioned that is a longer trend eh? so so we have now seen 40 years of ever lower inflation so from uh, five to six percent to in the eurozone be- structurally below two percent be- because they never got it above two uh, percent and that could be the end of that eh? so th- so this if if you uh, would put a line to those uh, inflation numbers, uh, then then the, the downward trend could end over time. What, what I think that um, so the the COVID it was called an economic sudden stop. So suddenly you stop everything, and of course then something breaks. So I don't think that uh, that um, has to do a lot with this longer term trend. It, it 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 does matter, and that is what you see now. If you really so. If you um, distort something that is totally de- like in a recession, that is totally different from breaking something. So COVID broke a lot of things, and then people started to adjust their behavior in all sorts of ways, um, um, and, and which means that uh, strengthening these supply chains again or, or fixing them is impossible because let's, for example, a lot of people have chosen to do another job because their job was not there anymore. Uh, uh, some uh, uh, c- uh, companies have deviated their supply chains to other products or r- routes or, or, or global regions, whatever. So that will take much longer. And, th- and I, most experts on this, on supply chains, I'm not an expert, but you read a lot, they already told governments, companies, whoever want to hear that, please, central banks, don't state that this is transitory. Everybody all central bankers will never ever say the word transitory again of course but they say this is not when something breaks it takes years to to fix it so uh, so uh, in some in some case I, i read one article that said yeah it is like planting a new tree it's a new supply chain no, that takes years so that that is one thing the second thing that is um overshadowing this especially because of this war and what i find um annoying sometimes that is um, we all want to go to a sustainable world we also all want to um, reduce the amount of greenhouse gas emissions but what politicians do they only talk about the end point in 2030 2035 2030 they all scream the the the, the one is earlier than the other this is where we want to go i want to go from a to z in one go nobody t- thinks thinks about b and C and D. And this is why you have a, a structural underinvestment uh, in, in traditional energy sources. And now that we have something that that um, um, distorts the supplies, in this case Russia or, or the, the Ukrainian war, yeah, then people start to look, okay, so, so we have not invested in, in quickly scaling up our traditional fossil fuel sources because we don't want that. But we have also not invested because the, the, the share of renewables is still very, very low. We have not invested enough. It also take time. And, and now we are watching it. Oh, yeah, so now our natural gas prices are, are, are tenfold, are rising tenfold. And this is the second part. Why is um, inflation at 7.9% in the U.S.? Partly because of this, but this was this is pre this is pre uh, uh, energy shock. Yeah, so, so we it, can it's expect going to go to March, nine. Can go to nine, yeah, nine yeah. ten, whatever. Yeah. It we could hit. We, we we could hit ten uh, if this Ukrainian war. So if if the retaliation from Russia goes further and really he stops uh, supplying uh, the West, um, that is a big if if he will do that, of course. But but this this is before. But even eight percent a couple of years ago, would you ever have imagined that that in the Netherlands uh, you would get seven point six percent of inflation? Yeah, in, uh, and 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 um, so so yeah, that is insane. And 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 that is an. And um, I also think this is and not so suddenly co- as well. Sorry to interrupt, but it's so sudden. Within one or two years, it just skyrocketed. Yeah. It's li- it's really moon like it is a yeah. Bitcoin chart. Like so you want to move stuff because demand is still there eh, because of the fiscal stimulus that was unprecedented. People, when we reopen, we want to buy stuff. We want to go out. We want to make up for everything that we lost in those two years. 
but we can't because there we want to have 100, but there are only two available because this supply chain is... So what happens to the price? And then second, we get a, a work... Even before that, the, the oil price was already heading for $100, right? So so mm -hmm. so this is, again, accelerating things. Uh, but we have completely ignored uh, because the, nobody wanted to listen to Shell or whatever. And, and, and I can imagine the whole idea. Uh, we, we want to get rid of these fossil fuels. I agree. But the way that you do it is also very important. Perhaps even more important, like Mahatma Gandhi uh, once uh, said, uh, the way that you do it. So, so I... I think this is something governments should look at the mirror at themselves. Where did they go wrong? Now they can blame this war, but they are also a bit to blame. And this is why inflation has not stopped at five percent, but is now going perhaps to ten percent. And that, and that is yeah because energy is just so big, and because of energy also other commodities and also uh, indirect links to commodities, uh, everything now pushes. Uh, and and that is also why a, a lot of people are really worried about that this inflation will never come down. It will, by the way, but um, yeah, that, that this is. Uh, unprecedented because of these two things colliding mm. that's a um, it's a perfect storm in a way right yeah, because we just is. came out of uh, reopening there was this demand shock and we actually went back and forth now there's this big supply disruption through the war and uh the i mean there's also in some form and maybe that's uh, the numbers that you can show um do you see also economic slowdown in the U.S. and you? It, we've been said that the that uh, actually central banks have been again uh, high interest rates, always in the wrong moment because there's a cyclical uh, 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 slowdown, and then they basically interest, like, raise interest rates when actually the economy is slowing down and so on yeah. and so forth. So on that part, uh, how are our economies doing, uh, uh, Doctor Blockland? <laughs> yes, well. There was no real patient, uh, so to keep it in your terms. Uh, so <laughs> all economies were profiting from this catch-up. Some some quicker, some slower. So, uh, for example, China is slower because it was already further and it has a different approach to COVID. Uh, but in most Western economies, you see, depending on how ma many uh, restrictions you applied until when, you see that these economies are catching up. And a lot of uh, uh, growth lost is, is, is made up. Um, so, so the starting point um, is actually pretty good. The only thing is that so today the ECB they lowered their growth expectation 0.5 percent from 4.2 percent out of my head to 3.7 percent. But if you only look what what energy is 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 the, the weight it has in the CPI baskets, the weight it has um, in 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 um, the wallets of consumers, consumer spending, it's not about that that. Energy prices or electric price, electricity prices have doubled. They have risen tenfold. A lot of people cannot, they cannot afford that, and that means that, and, and you already see countries doing that. They will, after COVID, they have to do another round of stimulus. They have to, they have to subsidize because people just cannot afford it to to put a heater on, and that that is really that is really struggling, and and, and we should not allow that. So they will be forced. But I think that this whole slowdown, especially in the Eurozone, it will be much bigger than we now expect. Also because we have all these uh, indirect um, um, uh, elements. Huh? So so um, um, Austrian banks with large Russian exposures. Uh, who told us that? Huh? Uh, and, and even um, if they would have to take a 10% write down, that would have been okay. But Russian banks, they have from... 100%, they have lost 99% of their value. So those these write-downs are massive. Again, it's the, it's the magnitude of the shock that matters. Then we get all these, these Eastern European countries with big uh, economic ties uh, to Russia. Uh, they, they, will in, they will seriously get into a recession. But then you can, for example, a, a country like Poland... So its its indirect effect is not as big as some of the surroundings, but 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 through the Ukraine and others, it will be hit, and then it hits Germany. Eh? So so it's like uh, domino so, effect. Uh, yeah, it's a domino effect, and uh, my guess is that we will at some point this year start to worry about the recession in the eurozone. I can also imagine that we get one. In the US, it's it's quite different. It's isolated. It's isolated. Its ties to to Russia are are less, and of course, it will be hit because uh, of the economic hit in Europe. But there, I I think we will not get uh, a, a recession, and that also means that monetary policy will diverge. So the Fed will go through with rate hikes, 
We hebben snel 6 of 7 this year. Because there is also a slowdown. Um, but yeah, I don't think uh, a recession in the US, a slowdown. In China, China can stimulate. And in, in the Eurozone, yeah, it's up it's up for debate. But that we go much, much lower than the estimates of the ECB now, which it still uses to 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 define its monetary policy. I'm pretty sure that uh, that these are much too rosy. Hmm. Can we anticipate some uh, new form of action from um, either central bank? Uh, uh, because well, we see that countries are stimulating. They're providing their citizens, for example, for sub- in subsidies for to pay energy bills. Yeah. But in times of crisis, you see a lot of central banks stepping in again, even though yeah, they have a forecast that never it's never right. And then suddenly they say, well, we have new data. Uh, is uh, data dependent, eh? data yes. dependent. <laughs> they are data dependent, <laughs> uh, which is, uh, I think, an excuse for looking, looking for an excuse. <laughs> um, but is what what can we anticipate from the ECB, Fed, maybe uh, Bank of China? Yeah, so so maybe I think the 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 Federal Reserve for me is the most um, uh, obvious one. Uh, so. Um, It admitted, so the ECB still still hasn't, but the, 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 the J. Powell admitted this whole transitory idea was wrong. We have to adjust. And he did that on a, on a very hawkish way. He made very clear, we made a mistake. There are now serious risks and we have to address them. And he will do so. And that means that for the first few FOMC meetings, rates will go up. Theoretically, if we would hit somewhere the coming months 10% inflation, this this 50 basis points instead of 25 basis points is still on the table. I don't think they will do it, but it is still on the table. And then in the second half of the year, you get this slowdown. And then it depends on the outlook on inflation. And, and then you see that base effects also start to um, uh, emerge. So even if oil price, the oil price stays as 110, it would still on its own, everything else equal, it would still push down inflation towards 3%. Maybe now a little bit higher, let's say 3.5%. But that is good enough, I think, for investors because uh, you have this um, this uh, survey, the Global Fund Manager Survey. They ask uh, the biggest uh, fund managers in the world a couple of questions. And one of the questions is, what is going to push the S&P 500 index above 5,000 points? We are at, uh, at uh, uh, 4,200 now, right? The biggest mention, the, 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 the answer that was mentioned the most is inflation back to 3%. Not 2%, 3%. 3% for investors is okay. Theoretically, this could still happen. If we then also have a slowdown, this is the, the point where I say, okay, we don't get seven, six or seven rate hikes, but it could be five, perhaps four, but five, uh, because then they will uh, deviate from that very aggressive path that they have to do now to restore its credibility because they were wrong and they admitted it. And then in the second half, I think they can they can slow the pace of rate hikes. They will not stop, but they can slow it. That, that is that is how I see um, um, and the Federal Reserve. Uh, and and while doing that, it will uh, draw down its balance sheet, right? So so that is that is my idea. Also because the impact of this this Ukrainian war you, um, is not not that big as in the um, um, uh, in the eurozone. China is further ahead in its economic cycle and has already started to uh, lower interest rates and also lowered its uh, required reserve. Ratio. And this is the, the the amount of money that uh, banks have to hold in their deposits, um, um, determined by the, the the Chinese. So if you lower that, there can be more credit growth. Now you already see that, and um, so I think they will continue continue to do that. Also because official inflation in in China is 0.9%. percent, so they don't have an inflation issue at least on paper. Um, so they have room to stimulate more, and this also has to do. One of the biggest leading indicators for the Chinese economy are housing prices because because in, in China, a lot of households, they create their wealth through housing and much less in financial markets. That is a little bit changing now because the mar- these markets are opening up and getting bigger, but still. And uh, housing pri- house prices in China are falling. Now, whenever that has happened for a couple of uh, consecutive months, uh, most of the time China has stepped in. The same as now. They are they are negative for five consecutive months, and already we see this stimulus coming through. It will it, it won't be as big as 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 a COVID reaction, uh, for example. But in a world where most central banks are are tightening 
monetaire policy. Um, um, the PBOC, uh, the Chinese Central Bank, stands out. So, so that is... The, and then we have the ECB. Uh, they, they, I don't know why they make their own lives so difficult time and time again. Because what they do is... First of all, they're always stuck with this peripheral versus core thing. And so whenever there are doubts, the, the, the spread on Italian bonds, they will rise immediately. But also, if you are addicted to liquidity, the first thing that you will do as a market, because you want to hold on to that liquidity, is to hit the ECB where it hurt most. So um, 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 Lagarde has introduced or is emphasized, I think that's the better word, um, uh, favorable finance uh, conditions. Uh, that, that basically means every country in the eurozone has to be able to pay its debt. So Italy with the 140% debt to GDP ratio, your interest rates must stay low. So the first thing that markets will do whenever they, they, they see a whisker of less liquidity coming their way, they will test the ECB. And, the, and that is where, she, where Lagarde has ended up now. And I think that they, they won't get the chance. So, so there are now 40 basis points still priced in for this year in, in rate hikes, depending on which steps, uh, 10 basis points or 25 basis points. But at least that is more than one rate hike. <laughs> My guess is they won't do it. My guess is they won't do it. Um, and also, um, so I do think they will try to end the purchases because they, they have, to, they have, they have, have um, pushed that a little bit forward. Also because they have this uh, inflation mandate, of course. But by the time that they have finished that, the economy will be much weaker in the Eurozone. And I don't think at that point you want to say okay we, we could be heading into a recession or even a, a severe slowdown now is a good time I don't think that markets will allow Lagarde to do it and that is because she always has this discussion on uh, financing conditions she, she, oh, the, the link with markets is always so strong whereas for the Fed sometimes it's really about the economy and, and unemployment and things like that and then they, they, they push these markets a little bit aside so so my guess is the ECB won't not, will not Hike rates. That would surprise me, um, uh, and 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 the rhetoric will change uh, also in a couple of months. So yeah, mm. long answer, but <laughs> no, but good answer, good answer. Um, but uh, on the other hand, there's uh, but there's still the inflation problem. So if you don't uh, raise interest rates, um, we might actually maybe even surpass the inflation inflation rates that we've seen in the US. Not sure how how that would work, but um, there's this dilemma of countering inflation with interest rates. And this tit for tat kind of approach of wanting to raise or not raise, and I mean yeah. they slowed down their their QE programs. Um, it, it's really like a, a deadlock in a way. Um, now it, it's a dilemma, but again, I think that the dilemma is perhaps bigger for the Federal Reserve. You also see in the updated numbers today. Uh, the ECB expects 5.1% uh, uh, for this year, but then it drops to 2.1%, and then the year after it's 1.9%. Magically, or what happens magically in between? At 2%. <laughs> Perfect. In any case, that means that you um, uh, do not have to do anything as long as you say that the things that you are doing now help you to reach that target. Right, so but that is you can also uh, 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 look at it the other way around. You can normalize whenever those that the two percent target is, is is in range. But 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 of course this is debatable. Um, first of all, on headline inflation, let's keep it on headline. And so core inflation in the eurozone is not that bad. It's it's two point six percent or so. So so that's that's and it will also drop. Uh, but headline inflation. First of all, my guess is that. Independent of what happens to GDP growth, I will come to that in one minute, inflation will come down. And because we have had the reopening, we have had the base effects, we had, yeah, so even if oil stays at 110, of course, if it goes to 200 because of the war, everything changes. But these base effects are very, very strong and they will take over now. The, the, the funny or ironic thing is that when you have been wrong so long, you cannot now say, okay, I was wrong on the way up. But I'm right on the way down, so I don't do anything. You, you, you cannot do that. So you need something. Uh, and that is, I think, for the Fed, a much more pressing uh, dilemma. Um, and second is, um, what lowers inflation, apart from base effects and supply chain disruptions that are easing, slower growth? So 
I strongly believe that growth in the eurozone will slow meaningfully. And that means less demand and that is always deflationary. Less demand means less inflation. So I think that the ECB could be right that in 2023 or 24, because of this slowdown, inflation drops like a stone and they don't have to do anything. Yeah, but 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 they they can they can tell you that like this. So because then they are they they risk being wrong on both sides. Mm -hmm. But this is my my uh, and we should not forget. And I I do think that a lot of uh, investors, economists, not but uh, investors, they forget once growth is hit, inflation starts to come down because there is no wage spiral. The the people are losing their jobs, not not creating them. And, and in the US, that is different because I think no recession uh, and and also less uh, growth scare. Uh, to put it this. So there. He has to be more power has to be more aggressive than than Lagarde, and and that is what she's um, um, also allowing herself, um, b but still trying to focus on that 5.2, uh, 5.1 percent. But uh, yeah, so so growth will be a big factor in lower inflation. That's my guess. That's my guess. Isn't there then the risk because that's what actually, if you could, well, one of the things that that might be indicated by, for example, governments printing money to uh, subsidize their uh, their people for to to uh, pay heating bills. Isn't there then the risk of stagflation? Well, first, so you so if the governments if they if they give out money, that is inflationary, right? So so that is that is uh, that is the interesting thing that if if there is another wave of stimulus because of uh, protecting spending power that is again you get you get to that dilemma that is inflationary but if it hits growth in the medium term and, and we had a recession it's deflationary uh, so so um, um, yeah th that is that is I think the interesting question so but but a, a central bank cannot wait what a government uh, does uh, they, they, that's also what they state they are independent uh, so so I th I think at these yeah th this is a little bit uh, th this debate that is going on and and um, my my guess is that in the end so i'm on, on the lower interest rate side on the lower inflation side on the, ba uh, the base effects uh, uh, side uh, but yeah i could be totally wrong of course um mm. yeah, so yeah but you've also recently i think if it was a few days ago you've talked about spiraling down wages um the fact that um the wages real wages are actually decreasing um yeah. already so that that push that we've seen that very high spike after the reopening where for example restaurants i could see everywhere uh, restaurants looking for waiters yeah. uh, for example and still still they still do eh? a lot of these yeah. these restaurants cannot find people because they 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 chose another career yeah so it's paradoxical isn't it because now thinking out loud you have a labor shortage so you have a gap for maybe low paying uh, basic I, I would say so um maybe not basic but uh, low paid jobs uh, like being a waiter or you know like other call center these kind of things um uh, yet uh, you have slowing down real wages but this slowdown is i guess also mainly due because of inflation that yeah. pushes down the margin of yeah. uh, so that the wages cannot even grow to compensate for the what inflation eats up uh, uh, from it. Purchasing power, yeah. yeah, the purchasing power yeah. in general. No, I, I think uh, there, there. So when your inflation is at eight percent, there, there's little protection that you can have happy yeah. because if companies start to uh, increase wages across yeah. the economy by eight <laughs> percent, then you know what happens. There's no way down. Now, that is good for people, eh? so uh, but it's bad for earnings. So that is what then happens. Then, then these companies will st stop investing because their earnings are are are, are obli obliter obliterated. But um, I think that would be a good idea. So, so I I do think that um, the whole balance between the power of earnings and the power of wages, or, uh, people versus companies, that is out of whack. Eh? So I I would like it to see it um, go uh, in favor of people. But what you will see. Uh, back to your real wages is that what do you do when your real wage is negative when you when you hit uh, 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 the news and it says you you are able to spend less in real terms two percent three percent four percent what do you do you, you you ease on your spending you stop your spending mm. and th and that is that is why it's so difficult if an, an, an outside shock causes inflation 
there are no good tools for a central bank because you have to fight it. But by fighting it, you push people down harder. And you know that in a couple of months, now maybe now quarters, it, when things normalize, and you should assume that things normalize, it would go down again. So there's, there's hardly any good uh, tools for an ECB. In real wages, yeah, m- my guess is uh, that, that you will stop uh, spending. And there's this nice chart uh, in, in the United States. You have the, the, the Michigan uh, Consumer Sentiment Index. And that is a pretty decent correlated with gasoline prices. And of course, gasoline prices uh, are only a couple of percentage points of the total uh, expenses that people have. But it also means uh, when gasoline goes up, also electricity bills go up and a lot of other goods uh, go up. Now, and you will see that that the gasoline prices were now at uh, above uh, four dollars uh, per gallon. And that never almost never happens uh, that uh, and and then you see this and and did did this this translation that you also have with these real wages you will see that the consumer spending uh, consumer sentiment will come down as gasoline prices rise or as your real wages uh, you can you can put any any uh, inflation related chart uh, on there of course uh, and 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 what do people when they do not feel happy uh, they will not spend and so and that is this is also why I think part of the inflation problem will be like normally um, solved uh, between uh, brackets uh, 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 by the demand side and yeah. not the supply side. The only thing is that then these people uh, are again out of a job because nobody goes to the restaurants again, and 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 that is that is the the ironic thing that happens. Uh, yeah, yeah. I, I will just put it out there, and you tell me if it's wrong or if I say something that is not true. If the energy shock. Uh, actually sustains you have the inflation which is mainly energy driven yeah. in the whole basket yeah. while people um, decrease in their spending behavior so a slowdown in this consumption thereby um, less goods sold and so on and so forth the economy actually starts slowing down people lose their job but yet bills are high all the structural problems that as you said supply chains they don't come up back again the next day it's not an on off switch mm-hmm. that you can do especially when we talk about geopolitical events here mm-hmm. we're talking about transporter pipelines that for example Nord Stream 2 has been now it's pretty sure like we will never see the light of this or at least not not anytime soon all those things they will take also years until they actually come back to their normal levels yeah so that that type of recession it might be even uh, i don't know worse than the stagflation from the 1970s. The 1970s had actually very similar uh, um, um, uh, factors. It was the war, Donkey Poor War. There was um, all, all kind of, um, the oil shock as well. There was uh, high inflation. Um, but levels of debt were nothing compared to what we are today. Um, so now we have a mountain of debt, but we'll with all those, and, uh, and also growing uh, demographics. We haven't talked about demographics yet, but the growth in demographics has been slowing down heavily since yeah. the last decades as well. So we have less people coming on the labor market. We have a labor. So it's actually um, very confusing, at least to me, uh, on how to make sense of all that. Yeah, but that is because 8% inflation, you don't get that every day. Eh? So it, it, it is more than normal that it raises these kinds of questions. A couple of things on that. Eh? So... Um, Yes, there are parallels with the 1970s, but there are also differences. Eh? For example, the oil intensity of our economies is less. Eh? So um, a lot of technology um, companies, eh, they, they, they need offices and power, but, but it's different than a manufacturing uh, building, right? So, so we also have to take that into account that our economies are not the same. The second part is that, fortunately, what we do start with is um, low Unemployment, so that means we are not starting from high levels of employ um, of higher levels of employment. Another factor is that a lot of people have what they called excess savings, uh, especially in the in the US. You had these uh, government transfers uh, um, of uh, payment slips and and things like that. Uh, so a lot of people have that. Of course, this is skewed. Uh, so the people who most need it. Unlikely they will spend it whenever uh, they're, they're the outlook uh, that, that they will lose the job of that they can spend less. Uh, but that is also and 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 again is also you you talk about um, the debt in a total level, but if you look at consumer debt, uh, household debt to GDP, and you add to that household wealth, it has never been better. Uh, so mm. their households globally again it's not evenly distributed. 
that that is something that we have to do something about. But there is a massive wealth, and, and it means that um, this should provide, if you can access that wealth. That is of course uh, the the big question. But let's assume that we can do that on average. Then there is a big buffer against an, 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 an a longer term negative shock. What, what buffer are we talking about? Because if we talk about the wealth, there's um, assets like stocks, which most people don't own, but I would guess it's real estate. Is it cash? Is it basically checking accounts? What what kind of excessive? Uh, for a lot of people, it's their house, and of course, during a recession, it's it's unlikely that house prices will keep on rising like they have done. But they also it's unlikely that they will drop as much as the, they have done. And that is simply because there is this massive shortage. in, in uh, So so this is uh, perhaps for most people, it is actually the biggest asset that they that they have. And of course, y- you need a house to live in, uh, but it does mean there, there is excess wealth uh, um, um, uh, to access. Um, and that is also with the excess savings that is more tangible. Uh, that is just money uh, 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 sitting on a bank account. And again, it's not evenly distributed, uh, but but th- I would expect that a recession, if it comes this year, could be uh, short-lived unless you go into a, a, a phase that, that, that oil prices I- indeed go to $200 uh, dollar and stay there for... Uh, um, um, but, but I don't expect that. Uh, so, so, um, I'm not sure if you know Alfonso Picatelio. We have had him on the podcast and today I've, I've seen him have like a brilliant piece and I, I, I hope I can restitute what he was saying. But the liquidity, the credit liquidity has not been the same, for example, when we saw a barrel of $110 a barrel, um, let's say, I think it was in the 1970s, the the last time it peaked that much. Um, oh eight. Oh no, sorry. Oh eight. Thank you. Oh eight. Not <laughs> I think the, the core message was: if you want to uh, have the same issues with oil, it has to go to 250 dollars or something. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that is that is yeah. yeah. Also, because you have to so take inflation that. into account. I have seen it. I've not re- read written the whole piece, yeah, but okay. but it it also says something about yeah. So so this is this is of course the big risk. Yeah? So. If we are all wrong about and 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 this comes back to, to, to the start of this of this um, conversation is um, how long is this war and and its 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 effect is is going to be with us and and how much retaliation uh, will there be? Yeah, because it is it is pretty clear that um, our let's say current energy infrastructure um, um, is vulnerable to these kind of uh, shocks, right? Um, so, so the, the, I, I totally agree that this is a big risk again, on, uh, because a central bank has not the right tools to push down inflation from mm. this uh, um, outside shock. Uh, so, so I, ca- I can relate to all the, um, let's say, uh, misery uh, stories uh, where 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 our economies go belly up for quarters after quarter after quarter. I also can imagine that this is a clear reason for central banks to stop tightening or, or take it easier on the tightening to make sure that financial conditions, which are still very favorable, remain very favorable or at least do not worsen. And and I think that, that uh, together with the, the wealth that there is, uh, uh, should make it possible uh, to make it, uh, let's say, especially in the US, a mid-cycle slowdown, uh, like we see uh, many times, and then we, we continue uh, uh, the cycle. That is my base case. But yeah, if people are telling me or start telling me that the uh, oil price will go to $300, yeah, okay, okay, then, uh, but, but I'm not there yet. I'm not there yet. And this is now the end of part one with our conversation with Jeroen Blockland. In part two, we ask him about his asset allocation methods, framework, data, metrics, how he sees things, and obviously how he navigates those highly volatile times. We also ask him about commodities. We've seen commodities spike, surge in the recent times, and we are wondering, is this going to last? Is this a month story? Is this maybe going to last in a couple of years or even decades? Are we witnessing a commodity super cycle? Talking about commodities, we obviously also ask him about gold. Why did he change his mind about gold? And how does gold fit in his allocation portfolio methods? We are witnessing unprecedented times and it's important for your assets to stay safe and to also obviously get the best info, research and data. And this is also what Jeroen's platform True Insight does. 
If you want to check it out, it's very easy. There's a one month trial right here in the link. If you like this episode, give it a like. If you haven't subscribed yet on the YouTube channel, smash that subscribe button. If you want to ask questions, have doubts, debate, or anything else, just don't troll in the comment section right below. If you're listening to us on other podcast platforms and you haven't left us a rating, please do so. It helps us reach more people. So, in the meantime, you will see us, you'll hear us in the next episode of the Gold Republic Podcast.